Welcome to the Solutions Podcast, everyone. I'm Michael Rosmer. I'm Jim Pastormontis. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the great ills that are in the world. Our idea is to discuss the great challenges that are faced in the planet today for civilization and then to discuss solutions and try and get some heterodox ideas thrown around, have a bit of a structured, logical conversation so that hopefully, collectively, you know, all of us can come to some better ways of doing things. So click the subscribe button, click the like button. We're going to do lots of these. We're going to cover different topics and I'm looking forward to diving into it with you. So good to be here with you. Good to be here with you as well, man. It's quite exciting, huh? Absolutely. Me and Michael, we're talking about this for a little bit of time. A little bit of time. Starting absolutely. it and uh, getting on the right time to, to get it going. Exactly. Exactly. So, so I guess, you know, the idea that we've had for this whole thing is, you know, there's lots of challenges in the world and I think we're probably more aware of them right now, yes. maybe than ever, uh, at least in our lives. And so the problem is, you know, lots of people sit on social media and they talk all sorts of shit yeah. and they complain, et cetera. And it's like, okay, don't complain to me unless you can come to me with some solutions. So we want to discuss solutions. That being said, uh, in order to identify the solutions, we first need to figure out, well, what are the problems? Sure. So uh, let's start there. So what would you say, I'm going to take some notes as we go along, mm -hmm. is one of the biggest challenges in the world today? I think the number one, at least in my uh, personal standpoint, would be um, the uh, tensions between uh, different countries and um, this whole thing about World War Three, and you know that's you know setting off potentially, which is uh, quite scary. I think that would be uh, quite catastrophic. What about you? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's obviously a very interesting one, and you know, one that. So I have this thing that I say, which is. I think this is quite possibly the do or die century yeah. for humanity. Right. Basically, it was really hard for humanity to be wiped out until about 1945 when we had the atom bomb. And then especially when the hydrogen bomb came along and so on. Now, our ability to destroy ourselves has gotten fairly significant. And yeah, I think like if I was to think of one thing that would be cataclysmic for mm -hmm. us, it would be some sort of a major nuclear war. Irreversible. Right? Totally. Yeah, yeah, and and it would happen so fast and be so significant, et cetera. So yeah, that's, in fact, I think it's actually, if you just think about it kind of probabilistically, how violent we are as a society and a civilization and things like this, the fact that we haven't already wiped ourselves out given the power at our disposal. It's incredible. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, I think that's absolutely one that uh, that would rank up there. So what would be some other ones? Probably a uh, pandemic like the one that we are experiencing now. So yep. I think that's that's quite interesting. Um, something like uh, you know the previous century where uh, the death rates were quite higher, and I know that people would probably say that uh, you know people didn't have the technology that we do today uh, to develop vaccines fast to do a number of things uh, that uh, we can do today. But I think that would be another thing. I mean, know? the interesting thing about that one is actually true. We didn't have the vaccines, but we also didn't have the ability to travel and spread it. Sure. So it's like both sides, right? The technology that is enabling us to fight it is also the technology that is, you know, potentially going to cause us issues. Do you think that that's like, okay, right now we're in this whole corona situation. <laughs> Do you think that that's likely to be a recurring problem? Or do you think, okay, this is, you know, a once in a hundred year event and realistically it's not kind of an ongoing issue? So I, th I think it's likely that there are going to be more pandemics, especially in our lifetimes. I don't think this is like once in a hundred years. Yeah. So if people looked at a pattern and said, yeah, you know, the last one was like a hundred years ago. So likely it's going to be, you know, another hundred years before the next one. Yep. I don't know. I wouldn't, uh, I'm not convinced. I mean, obviously the last big one was the Spanish flu, yes. right? 
Uh, and, you know, there have been a few in, through history. We're talking about pandemics uh, like this in particular, right? Something yeah. that spread so fast. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, fastly. exactly. I mean, look, there was H1N1. I think you and I had the conversation about, yes. I think you said you got it back I, in. I had it when I was a kid, yes. Yeah. So there's swine flu, there's Mars and SARS or... And Ebola. And yeah, yeah. So, so there's certainly been a few. So, yeah. I mean, if we look at that, it seems probabilistically likely... I wonder if, and we can discuss this in a future episode, uh, do some research on it, et cetera, but I wonder if the likelihood of that happening is somehow increased by the GMO, by the contamination of different food sources, by, you know, like, so the story is, okay, there's this wet market in China and this yeah. sort of thing. So I wonder whether it's increased or decreased by some of the things that we're doing. Yeah. And uh, so that would, that would be a cool thing to to research. What about... Uh, in terms of this one, and I mean, in terms of future ones, what about the positive sides of it? I mean, is it actually a bad thing? So obviously a lot of people die, that's, you know... Uh, terrible. Terrible, absolutely. Uh, on the flip side, and it's, you know, maybe controversial to say and cold, etc., but, you know, could it be Darwin at work that, you know, we've sat there and we've isolated ourselves so much that, like, we look at what's the problem in the States, right? High obesity rates results in higher death rates. Well, we right. know obesity is unhealthy for us, right? So is this nature's way of trying to cull us and push us in a certain direction? Or is this something that, you know, there's no redeeming upside for? Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's certainly quite, uh, quite an interesting uh, perspective. I, I don't know. It, it depends how you look at it. Um, I certainly think that uh, we should learn from every tragedy and yep. it would be very unfortunate if uh, something like this uh, went without us learning nothing. Yep. Yep. So um, yeah, I, I would try to be positive on this one and say, look, let's try to learn <laughs> from this and you know, um, so f for example, yep. the, the, this was a conversation I was having with somebody the other day. Uh, they were saying that, look, um, we should always be wearing masks at all times. It doesn't matter if there's a pandemic or not because the flu can like, you know, spread around and, yeah. and do this yeah. and that and that should have been a standard. And uh, this pandemic has kind of pushed that forward to make yep. uh, masks a necessity. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Are masks really a necessity? And I know that's a yep. whole separate conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. I would hope that uh, that we learn from this and yep. that we take positive actions so the next one can be, um, you know, combated much, uh, much more effectively. Cool. Okay, so that's, that's another one. I'm going to throw out a third that kind of is related to that, mm -hmm. which is uh, countries using biological weapons. Right. So, you know, this, I mean, who knows what the source of it was, right? Yep. Uh, but certainly increasingly we have an ability to manufacture viruses which are at least theoretically much more dangerous than this right. one is right and so uh that i think is a growing threat uh it's very interesting to me that we have technology like crispr now that we're seemingly on the cusp of what happened in the tech era where somebody can sit in their basement and design a computer program mm -hmm. that they can sit in their basement and they could design some sort of a new life form. Fires, yes. Yeah, Crazy. exactly. It's Which nuts. is, yeah, like potentially terrifying because, well, I mean, we have computer viruses. They would go crazy. You know, what could this do? It could yeah. be pretty, uh, pretty nuts. So, yeah, I would, I'm going to put that. Pretty devastating. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm less concerned about chemical weapons because I feel like, okay, great. Yeah, they're horrible in terms of if you experience them. Uh, there was just that explosion in Beirut that was like... Oh, yeah. What do you think about that? That was nuts. That was crazy. Like When, when I, I saw, saw the mushroom cloud, I thought, like, literally, I thought there's, like, a, something nuclear there. Yeah, yeah. Like, it was insane. Crazy. Insane. Yeah, totally, totally Man. crazy. Like, just horrifying when you see this. I just looked at it and I was like, whoa. I have to show you that I showed this to my wife. And... Uh, did you see the map before and after? No, I didn't. Like, there's there's actually a few factors that are totally missing. There's a piece of land yep. that's now overtaken by, like, just water, nothing else. Wow. Yeah. I'll have to check that out. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it was nuts. Uh, so I did hazardous materials training back in the day, and they showed us a video of, it's the largest non-nuclear explosion in history in a place called Texas City. 
people don't really realize historically, uh, Texas City was actually, I think it might have been like bigger than Houston or Dallas or something like that back in the day. Mm -hmm. But they had this, I think it was like ammonium uh, factory okay. there. And what they think happened was somebody was smoking on the docks and this uh, ship that would transport it caught. And they measured it on the Richter scale in Colorado. That's how big this explosion was. Oh, just shit. leveled the city. That's so, crazy. Yeah, back in like when the 50s that? or something. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, pretty crazy. So anyway, so in spite of that, in spite of the fact of like, okay, obviously it's devastating to the people in that area. At least it doesn't scale very well, right? Like it doesn't have this impact that's going to reach the whole country, mm -hmm. right? And so whereas something biological could. Yes. So yeah, that uh, makes it definitely... A, uh, do you think people being personally responsible, like the individual accountability of everybody, would help uh, reduce those significantly? Uh, it's a good question. It's a very good question. You know, did you watch that movie about Chernobyl? No. Uh, yes. So we, we started. Net, Netflix we started, or whatever. Yeah. Yes. Me and Vicky, uh, my girlfriend, we started watching. Yeah. And, but uh, no, isn't, isn't it a series? Yeah, I think it's like... Yeah, I so I, I didn't get to the end of it. Okay. I mean... It's interesting. I w did go into some reading about it afterwards, and there's some, I mean, it's slight historical inaccuracies. But, you know, you look at that, and it's like, okay, did those people need more accountability in yeah. order to solve that thing? I'm not really sure that that was really the issue. Mm -hmm. I think, it, like, it's a pretty good incentive that, hey, you're going to die a horrible death of cancer, <laughs> not to do it, you yeah. know? Whoever, like, you know, whatever happened in Beirut, uh, you know, say the same thing with the Texas City thing, you and your family being wiped out, pretty good incentive not to do it. Yeah. I feel like the incentive Absolutely. structure there is fairly strong. <laughs> um, so that's probably not, uh, and you don't have to worry about losing your job because there's no job to return there's, to. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that, you know, some of those things, ideally, where possible, I think we should look for solutions in technology. Mm -hmm. You know, like if we look at what we've done with nuclear reactors, Nuclear reactors, first of all, are much safer today than they were back in the Chernobyl days. Yeah. But on top of that, we're developing extremely safe nuclear mm -hmm. reactors. We look at what's happening with TerraPower and Gen 4 reactors and things like this. Uh, fusion, potentially, things like that. So I feel like that's a great example of where we learn from what's going on. And I think it's really interesting, too, with the biological stuff, right? We're doing mm -hmm. RNA platforming now for vaccines that who knows what will come of that. But, you know, we look for solutions in technology that potentially address these. And we kind of need to, I think, because just, you know, okay, we've got a population of what? Almost 8 billion people on yep. the planet. Probabilistically, somebody's going to fuck up. Yeah. Like, we will. Well, on a long enough timeline, it's going to happen, right? You've just got so many instances. It's the same thing, you know, there's all the police, uh, police violence, brutality conversations. Right, that's been right. going on. It's the same thing. Like, when you have enough officers with enough people that they're encountering, somebody's going to fuck up. Like, it's going to happen. Doesn't mean it's desirable. And that's an entire different conversation. That's a whole other that conversation. I know a lot of people would probably yeah, give feedback on, like, <laughs> hey, it's not that simple. It's not sure, just a sure. numbers thing. But which, which is true, which is true. But, but no matter what, your ability to get that number down to zero over a long enough time frame, maybe you get it down to zero in a year, yep. maybe a zero in 10 years, right? But on enough, when you have enough incidents, your yeah. humans are subject to error. And so, you know, you want to try and build some sort of a system that gets in the way of that error, hopefully, and corrects for it. So that would be my, uh, my take on, you know, is it, you know, somebody, is there an incentive problem? There's probably not an incentive problem. It's probably, you know, it's just dangerous to have, you know, explosives that can go off and level whatever it was yeah, but, but i think you're you're thinking like a reasonable person would mm -hmm. you know when <laughs> the, the the people that uh you you spoke of like those people that can be in their basements creating those you know yep. whatever yep. viruses or whatever yeah like, they don't think like you and me man so they don't they don't have any incentives uh you know of such in their mind but but are uh, they going to be assume. dissuaded by negative incentives i don't know yeah. i don't know I, I know you and me would. I, I, don't, I don't know that they would. That's I, what I'm saying. I, I feel like... So I, I remember hearing some research at one point in time that supposedly one of the reasons why tougher prison sentences don't tend to dissuade criminals is because they don't think they're going to get caught. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think you're going to get caught, 
then it doesn't matter how bad the sentence is, right? So, you know, maybe the solution partially is making it really obvious that you're going to get caught, mm -hmm. right? Um, which again, you know, you can address in different how ways. How do you do that? Well, for instance, Singapore is, you know, really good at it. And this, you know, this brings up the opposite side of the problem is like a surveillance state, right? So you can say, okay, right. great, a surveillance state yeah, yeah. maybe can pretend, can catch you, but do you want a surveillance state? There's mm. a trade-off there. So, you know, I think probably we'll get into that conversation at some point in time because that's in itself a little disturbing, yeah, right? If you look sure. at what goes on there. Have you watched uh, like some... There was a, a video I was showing, uh, you know, when my mom visited. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about this entire thing, and I was showing her. Um, uh, I don't remember wh where I watched it, but it was showing how in China they, they have, like, such advanced uh, monitoring, uh, oh, yeah. you know, technology and how it's, yeah. like, spread out. Interesting. So, like... Um, you know, they basically assign people a certain number and stuff yep. like that, and that's all tracked. Yep. And they can make purchases using their face, stuff like that. Yep. It was like a whole video, and I was like, oh, man, that's just, you know. It's, it's a little disturbing, right? It's it kind is. of a Brave New World sort of. Yes. Like, yeah, absolutely. I don't feel comfortable being tracked, like, in everything I do. It's like, yeah. He's a Facebook guy, by the way, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, and, that, and that's the thing, right? Like, I remember seeing a funny, uh, a funny meme about, they're like, oh, yeah, they put cameras everywhere. It was like talking about the police states of communist Poland or something like that, right? And they're saying all these, and then they're showing all these people on their cell phones sitting in a coffee shop. Right. But, you know, right. it's like it's listening to you, it can <laughs> videotape you, it can whatever else. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, so does that, is that a concern for you? Do you think that, the loss of privacy is a problem. Yes. It, now, it, it depends on what scale we talk about. Like, if it's like in China, yeah, it, it disturbs me. Um, it, it disturbs you, but it is a problem. Like, we're obviously always going to be uncomfortable with what's sure, sure. not in our normal experience, right? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think... You know, giving full control to any government uh, yep. is, is, is a problem. Um, I, I think there should be certain uh, power left to the people as well. Yep. Like, you know, if absolutely everything you do is tracked. Yep. You know, like they're even talking about cashless uh, societies and stuff like that where you have no cash. Yep. So everything is traced, whether it's your money or, you know, whatever. Like, uh, although cashless doesn't have to mean traceable. I'm just talking about the control. Sure, I, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. so, um, yeah, I don't know. Could, could it be a problem? I, I don't know. The, what I can tell you right now is, uh, it's, it's definitely disturbing. And, uh, but is it, is it a problem practically? That's, that's something to, to think about. Do you think it is? So, you know, I think, I tend to be a believer in a couple things. One is, I believe you more or less just need to accept today that your privacy is gone. I think that's that, sort of true. Yeah, we've just kind of passed that point that it's like, yeah. you think that your privacy is going to magically come back? Unlikely. Yeah. I think we're probably just going to go further down that way. The thing to me that is concerning is, and I actually do think that transparency generally is a good thing, right? Like, to me, accountability is important as part of the incentive structure. And you can't have accountability without transparency. Mm -hmm. The two go hand in hand. Now, accountability or transparency to who, I think is a very important question. Right. Uh, it's different between somebody able to go in and get a warrant to find out what you were saying on a phone call through some due process versus just anyone being able to listen in on your phone call. Right. Very different experience. Okay. So I, I think that's one, one thing that's relevant. But to me, it also comes down to governance systems. So I think one of the biggest challenges in the world today, or one of the most important issues that I don't hear many people talking about at all, is systems of governance. Mm -hmm. I think that systems of governance today are very outdated. Mm. Um, and and I'll, I'll kind of frame this for you in a few different ways. So if you just look back historically, uh, okay, you had you know something like monarchies, dictatorships, etc. These mostly gave way to some sort of representative democracy, mm -hmm. right? The theory of a representative democracy was you hired your local representative or you elected your local representative, they would go out to represent you in parliament. Now, historically, this made sense in a few key ways. Number one, people couldn't travel very far, very fast, 
So especially in, say, a big country like the U.S., like Canada, like Australia, like China, etc., it's not like you could have people voting in on issues that are taking place at the other side of the country. It's just unpractical, right? Mm -hmm. So you needed to have a representative to go there on your behalf. Right. Today, we're not in that situation. Today, I can vote from my phone. I can, you can get an instant response for what my opinion is on something. So they're kind of obsolete. As a proxy for me, having a representative is somewhat obsolete. The second thing was, apparently they considered at the time, I forget which, so which of the founding fathers said this in the US, but they kind of viewed the uh, Congress as a, a sort of uh, aristocracy. People who were kind of like the more enlightened among the society. Mm -hmm. Now this made sense because this was the period of the enlightenment and if you study the founding fathers, they were generally kind of renaissance men. Mm -hmm. They were all very interested in the sciences, in discovery, etc. And they lived in a very simple world. So it was primarily an agrarian society. They could know most of what was going on, and this is the early days of math, this is the time of Isaac, okay, yeah, yeah. Isaac Newton, etc. Most of what you're talking about farming, right? So the economy is quite simple. Mm -hmm. The economy is quite local. You don't have much internationalization in terms of people coming from different countries. You don't have many different currencies. You certainly don't have complex financial systems with sophisticated financial instruments and banking systems, things like this. Healthcare is relatively simple because we just don't really know much. Mm -hmm. Education is relatively simple because we just don't have much, you know. <laughs> and so it was reasonable that your representative could be knowledgeable in really all the fields of what was going on in the country. And they could make those decisions and they could be the smart person on it. Today, that's not true. Mm. Today, we have an incredibly complex world. Like, look, with all the experts that they had at the Federal Reserve pre-2008, they were, like, months before saying, oh, there's no problem with the economy. Like, everything's fine. Are you kidding me? A few months later, Lehman Brothers goes down. The Dow takes the biggest drop since 1987 or whatever. You know, you have the biggest depression or crash in the stock market, mm -hmm. et cetera, since 1929. You know, like you start going through, and they saw this not at all, mm -hmm. right? Now, if a few people did, great. Those people had better models. But the point is, if they, the supposed experts, didn't see this coming, how can your representative see this coming? Right. You look at, again, going back to the thing about Facebook, uh, you watched when Mark Zuckerberg was kind of grilled by Congress. Yes. There? And it's like, they're asking him, they're like, how does Facebook make money? <laughs> well, you have somebody running your country who doesn't understand yeah. how Facebook, which is like one of the most ubiquitous platforms globally, operates, like very basic things. Quite and embarrassing. Uh, uh, hugely embarrassing, yes. But how many things like that are there? Like we can talk about healthcare, right? The healthcare system is in need of massive reform in a bunch of parts of the world. Some parts probably do a pretty good job. Uh, other parts, not so much. But how many different people are involved in that? How many layers of bureaucracy are there? How do mm. decisions get made? Like how can you possibly make good educated decisions about that when you just don't know? And you might say, okay, well, somebody, you know, if you look at Haven, uh, the Berkshire Hathaway, Amazon, J.P. Morgan startup yep. to deal with it, they hired this uh, surgeon. I've read some of his stuff. It's very good. He seems very knowledgeable about, uh, uh, about the subject. So great, he's good in that subject. But what does he know about tax policy? Right. What does he know about education? What is it, you know, on and on and on and on. So I just think that system is really outdated. And I think we need a new system to deal with a fast-changing, highly complex world. Mm -hmm. I don't think our systems are set up for that. So I think that's like a major thing that needs to be addressed. What do you think are the first steps? If, if, you, if it were up to you to make some of these reforms, where would you start? I mean, it's a very good question. Very good question. Uh, because I do think it's super challenging. Yeah. Because of kind of, you know, unfortunately, the way the system was built, the system wasn't really built in order to be able to be changed. Right. It was designed to resist change in order to protect against abuses, right? So there was a logical piece around that. Um, so you can ask the question of, okay, are we talking about practically? How would you go about applying pressure mm -hmm. in order to get some sort of a change? And I think, you know, you probably have three ways, that you, three paths you could go down. Uh, the one that I always thought, I'll, maybe I'll leave that one to last. So the one is you have some sort of high-level leader who goes unilateral. 
Okay. Right? Just says, hey, listen, this is fucked up. I'm just going to throw it out. I'm going to disregard the law. I'm going to like push it through and be highly aggressive about it. Obviously, we'd need to have a broad base of support. We'd need to you know, plan things. So that, that's one way. I think that probably stands the least likelihood of success unless it built up to, you know, that point where the people were willing to give them that power. Because there's there are always going to be people that yeah. think that this leader is serving their own agenda. Of course. So, for example, there would be a conversation <laughs> yeah. to where people talk about Trump. They Absolutely. Think the guy is like taking things that were not working and he just throws them out the door. Yep. Now, there's a lot of people that think that's a great thing, but there's a lot of other people that think like... Absolutely. You know, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, and, and I, it's a reasonable concern because, listen, even if you can trust the person in power right now, right? So, like, I would look at Lee Kuan Yew, uh, the head of Singapore for about 40 years, mm -hmm. I think did a tremendous job for Singapore. I think it's reflected in there how well the country runs. Mm -hmm. So, great, you know, he had a lot of power, but is his successor going to do as good a job as him? Well, if the successor still has the same power, but isn't at some point, again, if you just think about the probabilities, you're going to get someone who's going to abuse the power. Yeah. So you kind of want a system that protects yourself from that. So, you know, how do you play with that is, is very interesting. Now, so I think that ultimately you don't want to land in a place where you're reliant on the position of one person. But I do think that one possible path would be that some very strong leader could make some unilateral uh, action in order to change things. The second way is I think you do really kind of a little bit of what we're seeing today, right? Which is you have people, you start to apply really aggressive group pressure, mm -hmm. right? Where you basically uh, get mobs pretty much and you kind of force change that way. And, you know, that's something that's to some extent going on today, right? We're seeing that. My, my preferred way, and the way that I think is probably most effective, maybe is a little bit idealistic, is I think you do it through the private sector. Mm -hmm. And the way that I think you do this is, I kind of believe in an evolutionary survival of the fittest type model of how the world works. And based on that, I think you might not like my idea, but if I build my idea and my idea is just clearly so much better than yours, mm -hmm. you're going to have to go along with it. Right. It's just the nature because you're going to get out competed otherwise. And Elon Musk is a great example of this, right? People resisted electric cars forever until Tesla came along. True. Tesla's come along. Now everybody has to do electric because <laughs> he's just proven right. that it can be done so well. Yeah. Same thing with SpaceX. You know, SpaceX came along for decades. Lockheed Martin and Boeing were doing a horrible job of reducing cost factors. He's come. It's so much cheaper now that it's free to put up this. That the satellites are free if you use SpaceX as opposed to their competitors, right? And so I think that's the most pragmatic way to make change is to say, okay, great. We're going to do it in the private sector. We're going to do, we're going to say, fuck all you guys. We're just going to do our own way. Mm -hmm. We're going to build it. And we're going to show you that our way is just that much better. And when it's that much better, you're going to have no choice. Right. Because everyone's going to want to be a part of our system because our system is better. And that's where I'm kind of hopeful for this Haven initiative when it comes to healthcare in the U.S., that that maybe can do something because you've got a lot of backing from some big companies. They have a lot of capital behind them, et mm -hmm. cetera. And so if they can come in and they can say, okay, great, we're going to kind of reinvent healthcare for, you know, about a million workers or something like that. If they can do it really well, then a lot of other companies are going to want to jump on right. board. You could end up with 15 million workers. Well, when you've got 15 million workers and, you know, most of the top companies in the country who are opting for this as opposed to something else, you're going to start to get pressure from other sides where people are going to be like, well, we want to be on part of this. What are you guys doing? Why don't they take over the system? Mm -hmm. and so what do you think? I, I think, okay, so I definitely don't have it as structured as you in, in my mind on, uh, yep. on how things should be. But personally, I think we should leave this for when we get a lot more nuanced in an, another Good podcast idea. Yeah, and yeah. go back to identifying uh, yeah, yeah, other, yeah. Other, sure. other things. Sure, sounds perfect. So, so that's a good reason why you guys should <laughs> click the subscribe button, smash obliterate it, hit the <laughs> reminder bell, and you should come back to next episode because there's going to be some very cool insights from this guy. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, sounds good. So, so other problems. So maybe I'll, I'll go back to my list. Keep the thing, throw them out while AI, we're here. Uh, going AI, going a little oh, too yeah. advanced. Uh, yep. So that's that's another uh, bit of a concern. Yep. Um, 
so things that so i i guess i would i would downscale from there um let's see here so I, maybe I, just quickly before we go yes. on talk to me a little bit more about ai so the the idea behind ai is that uh, basically the machine can get too smart and too destructive against humanity right yep. basically it doesn't sync with whatever we do it doesn't like what we do so totally. it goes and destruct yeah so there's there's this robot what is what is her name the one that has citizenship in uh, Saudi yeah, yeah, Arabia yeah. or something yeah yeah so it's like well that's you know that's interesting yeah uh, but when they can actually make all sorts of movements and you know start thinking for themselves and do, doing all those things Nobody can really tell uh, what the you know trajectory of uh, that conversation is going to look like. So, so do you think that that's because you know we could go and we could roll back to the science fiction films and books of the fifties? Mm -hmm. This has been something that they've been talking about forever. Is it a real concern? Do you think, or do you think it's you know in the world of you know the futurists who seem to always be wrong uh, that it's a big thing and really we shouldn't be so worried about it? I think it's one of those things where you cannot be uh, reactive, right? Yeah, yeah. You're supposed to be proactive about problems like this. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, what 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 is the downside and what what is the upside? The downside is tremendous if th things go wrong, right? Yeah. So, yeah. you're supposed to be very proactive when creating technology like this. That's my personal opinion. Um, so. I think it could be very devastating if it gets to a point where, you know, they gain their own consciousness and it can be restricted by anybody and they but might, might not even need their own consciousness in order to be problematic. True. Yeah. But I'm saying if it goes even that, that yeah, yeah. far, yeah. I don't know, there are several steps to this. We're, totally. I don't think we're very, very close to this yet, yeah. but uh, there, there are all sorts of companies talking about the future and how they want to make sure there's a robot in everybody's house that, you know, acts like they're made or acts like you know sounds this great <laughs> the robotic have you seen the robotic kitchen yes it's yes. so cool I would, I would definitely get that yeah uh okay so things I, like that can be useful oh yeah wrong. absolutely but something that's you know fully autonomous can move do do things it's like well reads your mind whatever then starts pushing thoughts into your mind <laughs> you didn't know no you man it's just yeah don't don't be reactive uh, when it comes to this. What do you think? I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I think that's like, we can probably do a whole topic on that for one episode. Maybe we can bring in some experts and interview them. Sure. Because, uh, yeah, I think that's a super interesting conversation. Obviously, lots of people talking about it in the world today. Uh, so I think that, you know, this maybe brings to another uh, potential concern, which is what about people losing jobs uh, due to automation? True. Things like that. And kind of the restructuring of the economy. Is that a major threat and problem well, for the future. Th th there is an argument that though there are sectors that are closing down, uh, there are sectors that are open up due to technology. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, what, what is the you know, true uh, net loss? I I is there a loss, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know the numbers to, to answer this question, yep. but I, what I can tell you is it's not just jobs that you know, of course. Uh, are being lost. There are new sectors that yep. uh, come to the market and uh, but yeah, it's it's certainly a concern by many people because they will um, replace all the you know traditional types of jobs, whether it be a cashier or yep. whatever. Um, so I, wasn't it you that were telling me about uh, this restaurant? Uh, where was it? Where they basically yeah, in Hong Kong. Yes. Yeah, they, yeah they absolutely. There's no waiters. It's just like right. you scan the QR code, you go and enter your order. It comes out on this little track. You pull your stuff off. It goes back. And yeah. the fucking thing doesn't want to tip either, right? So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I mean, there's huge financial benefits for the customers and for the restaurant. Yeah. And it's kind of a cool, kind of a cool novelty. So, yeah. And as minimum wages go up, you know, that, I mean, so I'll throw in a few different thoughts on this. First of all, interesting thing, I just finished reading a book, Good Economics for Hard Times, a uh, book by these two Nobel winning economists, I think 2019 or something, they won the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. And... So they talk about a lot of these modern issues and kind of what does the latest data say on it, right? And so I'll kind of give the two, two arguments and then we can move on. But so the one is, yes, of course, obviously new opportunities are creating new jobs, et cetera. Yeah. But that this is the first time in history 
where it is likely that we're destroying those jobs faster than we're creating them. Okay. For two main reasons. One is, if you think about kind of the migration that happened, say, from the agricultural society to the industrial society, uh, you know, we used to have 90 plus percent of people were employed in agriculture. Now it's like one or two percent, very right. low, right? Uh, those people were able to move to factories. Well, the factories were relatively low skill. So you didn't need a lot of training. Whereas if you were to move, you know, I spent a bunch of time over this past week delving into all kinds of different technology and stuff for software development. Like it's really hard mm -hmm. to learn the skill sets that you need in order to be highly effective right. in that area. And more so, kind of as the bounds of our knowledge go further, yeah, great, we would love to have, you know, AI researchers, we'd love to have people in fire reaches of biology and genetic engineering and you know whatever else. But these are simply jobs that it takes 20 years to retrain into, you know, or 10 years or whatever. It's not, fe it's not a feasible transition, right? Uh, the second thing is that just increasingly, even those jobs, because it takes 10 years, there's a big economic payoff for having a computer replace that person, right? right? And so, so I think that's an interesting part of the argument. I see, and I tend to be an advocate, that we're going to see a lot more of the services sector uh, grow. And you see this with things like personal trainers, people giving you massages, things like that. It's like, ah, are you going to replace? There's some value to human connection, right? I do think, though, it brings in another side of the conversation. So if we were to say, okay, one, po one problem in the future is AI, mm -hmm. one problem is displacement of work, uh, the thing that goes on into that is what about income inequality? True. So. True. Income inequality. And wealth inequality. I guess they go together. Well, on this topic, what do you think about the universal basic income that uh, they're talking about? Uh, so I'm against universal basic income. I think that it's uh, probably a really bad idea. Uh, Why? I, I think it's a poor allocation of resources. Okay. So. You know, I mean, we can start off by saying, okay, look, in order for something to be given, something has to be produced. Sure. And we can do the economic argument of saying, okay, well, how do you pay for it, right? But far from that, I think it's generally a bad idea to give a billionaire some money and <laughs> get, like, uh, seriously. Uh, yeah. Uh, as yeah. opposed to, like, look, we have welfare systems, we have social assistance, we have medical systems, we have et cetera, that are designed to help the people who are in most need. And I think you should concentrate resources to those people most in need and not to everybody else. So, yeah. you know, this is where, like, they've talked about a negative income tax, uh, an earned income tax credits, and things like this. I feel like those are better solutions where you say, okay, great, like, we'll top up your income to a certain amount. Mm -hmm. We'll do some of these. So, you know, I, do, I am a pretty big believer that we need some sort of uh, rebalancing of the pie and you know I was just thinking about this I think it was a day or two ago I was walking to the gym and I was just observing because you know so you and I are both entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and we can feel like hey we built this thing yeah and there's some something to be said for that absolutely uh, but there's also something to be said for I was just considering imagine if I was starting a business in the 80s mm -hmm. like today I can reach a global market like this yeah I was thinking uh, there's a it's probably the best business talk I've ever seen by Steve Jobs at MIT Sloan, and I've watched that. Yeah, it's a great talk. I love it a lot. And he's talking about how look to push out a software product today requires twenty million dollars. Right. And you think it's like no, it doesn't. Well, why doesn't it? It's because <laughs> back then distribution was like bricks and mortar retail. You had to somehow get yourself onto store shelves, and you had to produce a physical box and a physical thing. And then you had to somehow go and do the marketing to try and educate people to go and buy your product, which yeah. was extraordinarily expensive. Oh, yeah. It's day and night to today. Exactly. Today, you go on the App Store, you go on the Google Play Store, you put up your app, they take a small percentage. If they don't, like, uh, if you just watched, there was the four different founder, or not four CEOs, who were talking to Congress the other day. Yeah. And you had, you know, uh, Tim Cook was giving the numbers, right? He's like, look, 86% of apps, we charge them nothing. Yeah. And they have, like, a billion dollars of infrastructure at their fingertips, like code, you know, the ability to have all these tooling, all this backend infrastructure to launch their apps that cost them nothing. Mm. It would take you years to build that if you were to build it on your own. So did you build that on your own? If you had like a huge success in an app, did you, build, did you do that? Well, no, not really. 
Like, yes, you did. There was a, a critical part that you played. Sure. But you were taking advantage of a massive infrastructure that benefited you. Same thing today, you know, so we see Kylie Jenner, right? Kylie Jenner went from like nothing to billion dollar net worth or whatever the heck it is, very, very fast. Well, it's so easy to do contract manufacturing today. It's mm -hmm. so easy to do global distribution and shipping. It's so easy to market and get your message out really, really easily. You can be direct consumers. So you don't even need to go in store shelves. Like all these things, we have a tremendous ability. And so as a result, it makes sense that there's some sort of a rebalancing. If you take, it, it's, it doesn't make sense that the person who does this one thing, who benefited from all of this, gets to take all of that for themselves, mm -hmm. right? It's like, okay, does it make sense that somebody can go from like, don't get me wrong, I want to take advantage of it, <laughs> right? So, so there's like, but I, there's a pragmatic side of me that I can see that this extreme effects of very rapid scale uh, cause problems, cause imbalances in society. If you have a few winners, you have kind of winner take all markets, where a few people come and make really, really big output, mm -hmm. and then most of the other people don't, that's a thing. Um, what do you think about all the people that say there shouldn't be any billionaires? They shouldn't exist in the first place. I don't agree with that. I don't okay. agree with that. Yeah, so, so I don't think that there's any arbitrary number that you should cut it off at. I think to some extent, there's a lot to be said that the basic rule of management is move resources to where they're most valuable. Mm -hmm. And there are some people who are simply better at using resources than others. So I feel really good that Elon Musk has a lot of money. Yeah. I feel really good that Bill Gates has a lot of money. There's a bunch of billionaires, so I don't feel really good that they have a lot of money. I think that they sit in there, do, they do nothing with it, right? And I think you were having a conversation with me about how politicians should have a bigger financial incentive as yeah. well. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Absolutely. No, like if you can come and you can reduce the cost of healthcare by $10 billion a year, then for you to make $100 million for that, I have no problem with that. Yeah. Like, you know, it was 1% of the benefit that you brought in. Yeah. So I, I do think that there's some value in that. Uh, what, what I think is a problem is that we don't have a system of merit, largely. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we like to believe that we're in a meritocracy, mm -hmm. but actually a lot of luck plays into this. I just think about this with respect to inventions, right? You could have, what well, we have right now, there's, I think, 138 attempts on vaccines, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so this is corona vaccines, 138. Which one of them succeeds is mostly a result of luck. Mm -hmm. Because... Do you, you think know. so? Yes. yes. Most, like, mostly luck, you would say? Uh, yeah, I do. Because mm -hmm. I think that you can't argue that the people who will have the one that succeeds are smarter than the guys over here. Okay. I don't think... Like, I think that people have to look at it and they say, hey, listen, we can see a possibility that this path could pay off and we're going to go down that path. They may go down that path and they may discover it doesn't pay off. Somebody else goes down a path, that happens to be the one that pays off. You didn't know that before you started. I mean, that's true. And, and second of all, every other participant who goes down a path and it doesn't work makes it easier for the guy who gets to choose from the paths because he can, oh, that path didn't work, so let's not go down there. They don't have to waste <laughs> their time. So this guy here doesn't get a win. They don't get any kind of financial payoff. This guy here gets an enormous payoff, but mm -hmm. this guy may have benefited from the fact that this guy failed. Right. So how does that make sense? That's not a really great distribution of resources, mm -hmm. right? So I do think that we need to find some ways of redistributing. I'm a big believer, uh, and we can do a whole episode on this, but I'm a big believer that there are some ways that you can make the tax system fair that I think would go a long ways to help to start off to with. To incentivize. Yeah, yeah, like right now, so I think it's a really bad thing that somebody can be richer than somebody else because their tax planning was better. Right. Even though I'm in the tax planning business, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I think that basically if you put in the same work as I did, mm -hmm. you did the same thing as I did, we should basically come out in the same place. Yeah. We, we should try and design the system that way. But the reality is it doesn't work that way. The reality is it's like, oh, hey, well, I got my money as capital gains and you got yours as earned income, so I pay half the tax that you pay. You know, hey, I deferred my tax and reinvested it through compounding and you had to pay tax along the way, mm -hmm. so I ended up ahead of you. That's not really, it's like, look, we did the same thing. We had the same economic output. We should end up with the same thing. So I think that's a bad, poorly structured tax right. system. Uh, so we, we can do a whole, whole thing on that. But yeah, that would be my view on... Uh, I would love to see what you guys think about this income inequality, what, uh, what you think some possible solutions around it could be. Comment down below. Let us know.
Yeah, absolutely. So, so here's a question though for you. Do you think that income inequality is a problem? Okay, I, I, th I think that's a bit broad. Okay. Um, so is income inequality a problem? Income but, slash wealth inequality. So yeah. are, we, are we comparing the one side, the guy that's like a, a multi-billionaire and the other side that, uh, you know, they don't have uh, any resources or, you know, even work to put uh, food on the table and there's starvation in, sure. in Africa? Sure, well, sure. I mean, let, let's ask the question. Okay, let, let's assume that it is a problem. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with it? Because there's an argument that I could make, which I used to make for quite a few years. I no longer hold to this. But I used to make the argument that I said, who cares what the gap is? Mm -hmm. I don't care if somebody has 10,000 times more than this guy here. What I care about is what's the lowest level. I want to make sure that I'm raising the poverty rate, right? So that people are, the base level is higher. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that the median is raising because that tells me that broadly the population is going up. If those two things are rising, perfect. What do I care that somebody else is rising faster? So do you think it's a problem that even if those two things are right, is, is the problem poverty or is the problem a gap or is it both? Hmm. Um, so, so I definitely think poverty is, is a problem. Like, I would agree. Just, just to answer uh, that, that side of the question. Uh, I don't think there should be a single human being that, that lives in, in poverty. Right. Um, I mean, it sucks that Look, I was born in Greece, and if I was born, you know, somewhere in Africa in a very poor village, totally. I would likely not be here today. Absolutely. So I think I think that's a problem, yeah. um, and and I think it, it's actually quite a waste that uh, I mean, there's, Huge there's so waste many of people. Human potential. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So so fr from from that perspective, yes, absolutely, it's a problem. But do I think it's a problem that? Uh, a guy came up with a great idea and benefited from it and, uh, you know, became enormously successful. And there's this huge gap between the billionaires and, and all the rest of the world. No, I don't think so. Okay. For much the same reasons uh, that uh, you mentioned. So, so I used to hold that view. I no longer hold that view. Uh, I think that there is a problem uh, for a couple of reasons. And this will take us off into some other, other problems, which is great. Okay. I love how there's kind of a chain of problems. Yeah. So I think that the first big problem is that when you have extreme concentrations of wealth, you create corruption problems. Mm -hmm. You have people who have enormous amount of power that can distort the incentive system and the structure around them in ways that is not healthy for the system. And so that's the first thing that I think is problematic of it's probably extreme, fair thing wealth, to say. extreme wealth inequality. Not that it's intrinsic, right? Because you may have some very benevolent person who's going to do that. But when you have this environment that's producing those sorts of outcomes, I think yeah. that is the consequence of it. So that's yeah, the first yeah. thing. The second thing is, I do think it tends to lead to, and I think we're seeing this a lot with kind of the rise of populism, etc. Uh, we tend to see that it leads to social unrest. Mm -hmm. And there start to be other problems that come out of that. So Although I'm like, like I said, I'm certainly not against billionaires. I'm certainly, I hope to be, you know, a deca billionaire, one centi trillionaire. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> uh, although that may be the case, I do think that we want a system that tends to uh, attempt to bring that more in scope. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that would be my perspective on it. But 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 it's it's a problem. How like. I, like I said, I, I think I think that the problems and you can't. There are some statistics. I understand about the corruption. Yeah. But what about the gap, right? So there is this huge gap between this guy and this guy. Okay. Put the corruption aside. What is what is a problem other than that? I, I think that it starts to create social social issues. Okay. Uh, so basically, you get a large body of people who become disgruntled and unhappy with what's going on. They bas they see the gap, mm -hmm. right? And they have a perceived injustice. And then they start, their behavior starts to reflect that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether that means that people go out and they start to buy things that they shouldn't because they can't afford them, or whether that means that they go and they start to, you know, commit violence. So there's, there's some stats which suggest that uh, poverty is not nearly so correlated with violence as inequality is, mm -hmm. uh, in particular inequality within neighborhoods and things like this. So they can kind of look at the Gini coefficient and things like that but I'm, I'm just kind of confused though so there is a bit of a contradiction you do believe there should be billionaires you do believe there should be like you well, want to be I, I, I'm not saying that there should be billionaires 
I'm saying that people should be allowed to be billionaires. Sure. So provided they earn it, I think it's perfectly good. Right, which yes. is my original position yes. as well. Yeah. I think like if somebody creates something yep. and they earn it, absolutely. Yep. But then you're saying the inequality uh, yep. is, is a problem. Yeah, and, and I'm not saying that it, uh, it means that we should get rid of inequality. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that we should be careful about how we manage it and what's going on with a system that tends to create it. Okay. So I think that, I think that whether I like that or not, there are negative repercussions to extreme inequality. Mm -hmm. And it's hard, we can probably have a whole episode and discuss this, is that a correlation or a causation? You know, is it like, okay, well, these two things happen to go together, or is it that this is actually causing that? Tough, tougher argument to make. Sure. And we can, we can have that Fair conversation. Enough. But yeah, Fair I think enough. that it's certainly a modern social issue. I mean, Hollywood stars are running around saying that, hey, listen, this is a problem. You know, like, I mean, yeah. it's partially virtue signaling and all this kind of stuff. But there, it's certainly a big social issue uh, at this point in time. And I think it's... I wonder how this conversation would be if there was absolutely no poverty and people, um, you know, were paid fairly across the board and, you know... Um, I, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because so you can look at, of course, countries where there is pretty good base levels, right? I mean, Singapore has a pretty great base level. Switzerland has a pretty great base level. Norway has a pretty great base what level. What happens there? I mean, these are generally pretty good off systems. Uh, the outcomes tend to be pretty good in you know a variety of regards. Uh, so the way they measure the Gini coefficient, the Gini coefficient tends to be lower. Gini coefficient is a measurement of uh, inequality. Again, okay. we can do a whole thing on it. Uh, so the, Gini, the, the inequality is measured as being lower than in some of these other places. Mm -hmm. How they get to that, you know, we can go through and we can break that down at some future point. But yeah, I think, I think it's a really interesting conversation. I think it's worth diving into. And uh, yeah, I think it's, again, you know, is it correlation? Is it causation? Is it, you know, it's, okay. it's a complex issue, but I think it's one. But I, I do think this brings up another topic, which is, really, really important, which is the subject of corruption. Right. And I think the subject of corruption as, I mean, it's kind of a human problem, right? I don't think it's necessarily a modern problem. It's a problem throughout history. But I do think it's a major issue that we face as a society. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, in extreme cases, such as you're talking about like Africa and places like this, yeah. like it's interesting to me, I had somebody tell me a little while ago, they're ah, Africa, you know, like I could go in there with a few billion dollars, you could fix the problems, no problem. I'm like, I think you underestimate and don't understand how complex the problems are. And part of the problem, I mean, look, we're sitting here in Bulgaria, right? Government corruption is a known thing. They have had protests and riots out for the last few weeks. But Though I think it's gotten a little better over the years. I oh, yeah. Th I, th I think like... It, <laughs> which says something in itself, how yeah. bad it was, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but, like but 20 the whole, years ago. Was, yeah, yeah, it was really bad, really bad. Um, but I do think that corruption is a big impediment to development. Mm -hmm. So when we look at these countries where you say, wow, what a waste of human capital, what, you know, all these people who could have this improvement, mm -hmm. one of the big barriers is, hey, people are like stealing the food, you know, yeah. people are hoarding the resources. They're basically using poverty and starvation as weapons They're you know, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think that's a problem. And then I think you can really look and say, like, I mean, look at what's gone on in the U.S. over the last while and all the things coming out about corruption. So, right. you know, I think corruption is a big problem sure. that is worth, uh, worth having a whole conversation about. And then I think the conversation that comes from that one is criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. So uh, the corruption conversation, I think, is a little bit, it's an age-old one. Okay. I think what's interesting about the criminal justice reform one is that... Uh, we live in a different world than we have historically. Mm -hmm. And so how I frame that is I say, listen, back in the day, you lived on a farm. If somebody's a killer, you throw them in the dungeon. <laughs> you know, they're locked there for 10, yeah. 15 years. They come out, they go back to working on the farm. Today, the world changes so fast that if you're in prison for 20 years, that's a life sentence. Mm. Like you can never adapt. You will come out and the world will be unrecognizable to you. Imagine if you were thrown in prison in 1990 and got out in 2010. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, like <laughs> no internet, basically no personal computers, Yeah, no smartphones, no social media, no broadband, no like, 
you're going to come out and you're like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> you know? So in my opinion, we really need to come up with a better solution for how to deal with criminals. Yeah. And I, it's interesting to me that I've, on numerous occasions, tried to engage in people with this conversation and they have zero resourcefulness around it. Mm. I have pretty much not found a single person who's resourceful. They'll admit that this is a problem. But resourcefulness around solutions to that problem, pretty much never see it. I think we can talk about uh, Singapore again when it comes to when it comes to this and how they um... kill people. <laughs> <laughs> Do they kill people? Sometimes, yeah. When, when, when you fly into Singapore, you get a little sheet that says drug trafficking is punishable by death. Don't they also do that in China? A few places I think they do. Yes. Yeah. I was reading something the other day that uh, they were killing another Canadian guy for, uh, for the same thing. Wow. Yeah, it was like a second Canadian guy that day. It was like, it's really? crazy. Yes. Yeah, yeah so, there's a bunch of these. They take it pretty seriously. Yeah. No, you know, but th- there is also a conversation about if the punishment was this much harsher, would it prevent uh, a lot of those temptations some of those people have? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, and I think that it's convoluted a little bit by the fact that the court system is very bogged down. So if you look at, you know, in the U.S., it costs more to execute someone than to keep them alive in prison for life. Like, you know... I mean, what's going on here? I mean, the U.S., they have private prisons, which is a really negative incentive as far as I'm concerned. Like, right. the incentive structure is ridiculous. Uh, I don't know how you can justify that. But so, so I think that part of the... When you have a punishment, you could drag on the court proceedings for literally, like, 10 years. Mm-hmm. It's quite different than when it's like, justice will be met out very quickly, mm-hmm. right? It's like, hey, listen, you're going to show up. We're going to address this. Next week, you're sentenced, it's done, it's over, you know. But part of that comes back to our early conversation of, you know, you don't want to punish innocent people. Sure. Right? So you have to have some way of having ironclad evidence that this person is, in fact, guilty. Yeah. And if you don't have ironclad evidence, well, then, you know, what are you going to do? Um, so, so I think that's part of it. But, but I also think that you know, okay, we can look at, you know, making societies less violent, and there's lots of evidence showing that that is, in fact, the case. There's that Stephen Pinker book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Mm -hmm. uh, which has shown kind of how we've improved in that regard, uh, which you can dispute by the idea of potential violence versus violence, and that's a whole other conversation for another time. But, uh, but, But I think that beyond that, there's this question of like, okay, how do you rehabilitate those people? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very interesting, I was mentioning solutions in technology. I think that's very promising. Uh, There's a great TED talk on what we've learned from 83,000 brain scans. Mm -hmm. And we didn't used to be able to, basically what the the guy comments on, he's like, look, psychologists are the only type of doctor who doesn't examine the organ they claim to treat. And, but now with brain scans, we can see how people's brains, in the case of a bunch of these criminals, I'm not going to say all of them, but a bunch of them, you can see how there's problems in their brain in terms of how it's functioning. Mm -hmm. And we now can start to work on various different processes to like rehabilitate the brain. And then if you add into that something like Neuralink, where they're hoping to, you know, be able to right at the neuron level, be able to move things around. Should probably clarify what Neuralink is. Sure. Not everybody is. uh... So, So Neuralink is a company started by Elon Musk with this idea of, uh, a neural lace. So basically, you would be able to connect a computer to your brain directly. So they can basically do an operation and implant it in there. And the hope is that this will help to be able to treat things like Parkinson's, uh, basically be able to stir up when a part of the brain is not functioning properly. Stimulate it. Stimulate it, exactly. And uh, so very, very cool idea, very cool technology. Uh, If they're able to succeed with it, which there's obviously enormous engineering challenges, but, you know, it would be revolutionary for life if it also, you know, I don't know, the product market fit might be a little off there. I don't know. Elon how is confident. I mean, Elon is confident. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. But, but something like that, I think we could start to look at, hey, listen, the sentence rather than, hey, we're going to throw you in prison for 25 years where you're going to sit in your cell and what are you going to do? Yeah, you know? I, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. somebody could get rehabilitated and you could say, oh, look, well, we know that there's neurological problems that are going on here and we can address those underlying neurological problems and kind of 
get the person back to quote unquote normal. Right. Like that's very interesting. So yeah, I think that's to me a subject that's pretty uh, pretty worth worth diving into. What are, what are some other major problems in the world today? Okay, I mean, I think some people by now are probably thinking, why the fuck have these guys not discussed about climate change? Right? Sure, sure, so, yeah, that's, that's a uh, one that's, that's, that's a pretty up. major one. Yep. So, so and, and an interesting thing about that one is, you know, you were mentioning the problem with poverty. Well, the reality is if you add, you elevate the level of consumption of some, I don't know, what is it, like five to six billion people mm -hmm. uh, to the level of the top one or two billion, you're going to have a lot more pollution problems than you have today. Mm. The, there are quite a lot of uh, companies that are coming up with all sorts of ideas about how to help the environment. Some are very interesting. Super interesting. Uh, for example, uh, this one, I know there's many, many companies now, but there was uh, uh, these couple of guys that they started uh, this ocean project. Uh, I don't know, with this uh, tube that attracts all the plastic. Oh, very uh, interesting. Have you have you not I don't heard think of I've it? seen it? Yeah, yeah. So the like no no matter how well that's uh, it's not no matter how deep it is, but it goes pretty deep. Like it just attracts all the plastic and it goes up. Very it's interesting. Like, yeah. Very so interesting. there's there's quite a few of those. Um, but yeah, climate change is uh, the other thing uh, that most people are concerned about. You so, know, this guy uh, Dan Pena. I don't yeah. know if you know him. He was uh, he was talking about. Um, how he went uh, to the Arctic with with his wife to yep. renew their vows, and he was talking to scientists there, and they were saying, "Hey, it's all you know, cyclic. Doesn't doesn't matter. Like this is this is normal stuff." And he was arguing that, um, well, if in thirty years the ocean levels would be this much higher, uh, you know, London would be gone, and so many other places. The banks would not give you any loans for, you know, whatever mortgages and whatever. Like, why the fuck would they give you a 30-year-old, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mortgage, for example? He was making that argument. Sure. I was like, hmm. sure. I mean, that's interesting because he says, um, he was suggesting that the banks know everything in advance. Like, the, if it's not in their interest, they would try to shape their policies somehow to where they, uh, they don't give out these loans and they don't... Uh, um, they don't do those things. So. So, so what do you think about that? I don't know. I, that's the, I, I mean, about his, uh, his perspective? Uh, his perspective and the broader perspective, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think if climate change were to be true, um, <laughs> it, it, would, it would suck quite a lot. Now, really? <laughs> yeah, it would suck quite, quite a bit. Well, be, so, before we go into that, maybe we should define what we say as if climate change were true. Because, of course, the climate is changing. Sure. Right. So basically, the uh, the planet would uh, heat up a lot more than it does now. So the poles would uh, melt up. Yep. Um, so there would be a lot more water available, uh, you know, on the planet, and therefore the you know ocean levels, levels would rise. rise. Yep. So basically, uh, yeah, lots of uh, the habitable areas would then yep. uh, be covered by by water. Sure. So, yep. So people would have to move further up. So. Yeah, I mean that sucks. Yeah, um, I like going to Maldives. Like I said, <laughs> you know, it's uh, would uh, so. I mean, the Maldives would be completely gone oh, yeah. by those scenarios. Absolutely. And, and, and I mean, there's there are a couple of scenarios that that are being brought up. I, I don't remember exactly how much uh, the, the the extreme ones. I think are eighty meters. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> like so, you know. Yeah, so maybe before we go into that, I'll back up just slightly to address the Dan Pena thing. Uh, because, of course, there's cyclical changes in, uh, in the environment, and, uh, and there's lots of discussion that can be had on that. That's a whole, whole other thing. Uh, I don't think that his rationale, his thesis underlying that argument, is necessarily valid. Mm -hmm. I don't think that bankers are that smart. Uh, <laughs> And I don't think the bank's incentive structures are designed to look out that far. Mm -hmm. So these things are, uh, first of all, banks tend to, and people in general, tend to underestimate exponential change. Mm -hmm. So when you look and the ocean levels rise you know, by an inch or something, you're like, yeah, whatever, right? No big deal. 
So I'm still going to finance that. What, this is going to be underwater? Mm -hmm. You know, like you're not sitting there calculating out. When you add up to that, it's like, oh, well, it's going to go from one to two to four to eight to, you know, like whatever the numbers happen to be. They're just really bad. People are really bad at making those projections. And so it wouldn't surprise me at all that banks would be left flat-footed. Yeah. It wouldn't be the first time. I mean, look, we've seen technology companies go crazy and a bunch of other stuff go badly. You know, the banks didn't see it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the banks, there's lots, banks make mistakes lots of times. The sure. world is very complex. And like I said, I think a big problem in the world of banking is that the incentive structures are not right. Because it's shareholder money that gets lost there, not their money. Mm -hmm. The person who sells the loan, like if you think about what happened in 2008, right? Like, or uh, I think we had this conversation about the incentives around uh, giving loans uh, to particular groups of people. Mm -hmm. And it's like, look, everybody's incentive is to give the loan. Yeah. The guy who wants the loan is there, the salesman, the banker, the people who are lending the money, like everybody wants this to go ahead. The only people who are gonna who are in a bad situation are the people who might actually lose money. Right. And banks turn it into a bond and sell it off anyway. So like, what are you talking about? There's not really. So yeah, I, I wouldn't agree with his argument as being a very good one against the idea that there's going to be some sort of climate change. Uh, insurance companies maybe a little more mm -hmm. because they have like a little bit more uh, skin in the game. But I think it's quite possible too that their knowledge is just outdated and it's like they're running on age-old models that have a certain probability of whatever's going to happen because the nature of statistical uh, risk analysis, we should do an interview with uh, Nassim Taleb about this, but it's past looking, mm -hmm. right? You basically say, oh, well, the worst case scenario that happened in the last 50 years was this, so therefore the worst, th and it's like, well, hang on, the, that was the worst that had happened then, but if that was the worst that happened then previous to that, there was something that wasn't as bad that was the worst. Right. So you're, you can get a new worst, which is much worse than the previous one. So I, I don't think that that rationale holds up very well. Uh, as for... To, to interject a little bit. Yeah. So uh, just like you said, it is cyclic. We, yep. can, we, can, we can agree there. Mm. But, but we can agree there is cycles, whether yes. that explains the totality of what's going on the rapidity, the pace of change. But do we accelerate it? Is you know that's the so argument. I, I think that's yeah. yes, and yeah. I uh, and I can I can probably agree there. Um, yeah. There there is plenty of evidence mm -hmm. uh, that suggests that uh, the kind of actions that humans take uh, on Earth are you know sure. pretty harmful. Yep. Uh, and basically contribute to this. Yeah. So for for example, cutting down you know forests of I don't even remember how many acres per yep. you know whatever minute is like man that's terrible right sure. uh, endangering animals and doing all those things and you know whatever there's, there's so many things sure. that, that 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 we're doing to contribute so do I think we accelerate whatever this is I think so yeah so uh, a few things there I think uh, I make a couple different arguments on this point one is hey, listen, I don't like pollution in general because I like clean beaches. You know, I like to go on holidays. I don't like to see beer bottles and plastic and used condoms on this <laughs> you know, beach, etc. So I'm in favor of clean environmental practices. Whether it has anything to do with climate change or not, I'm still going to support that, right? Number two, I think there's just a very basic equation that I have never heard a good conversation uh, against. And that is, you can just examine the carbon cycle in our atmosphere, forgetting about, you know, methane and other forms of, oh, I guess methane is a carbon-based fuel, but uh, forgetting about, you know, I don't know, something to do with air conditioning and its effect on uh, climate change or whatever. Just if you say, okay, purely looking at carbon dioxide, look, there is a certain amount of elements in the world. Mm -hmm. That amount of elements is more or less constant. We've, what happened, like where does carbon dioxide go? It goes into trees, okay? That's more or less plant life. Like if you look historically like whatever, four billion years ago on the earth, the earth's temperature was very high. What caused it to come down was plant life. Plant life basically took this high carbon dioxide environment and reduced it to being a more oxygen environment. So certainly two things have simultaneously happened. We've undeniably burned a lot more carbon, mm -hmm. okay? We've taken it out of the ground. 
we burned it, we burned trees, we burned all this stuff. So if you want to argue that the level of carbon dioxide is not rising in the atmosphere, you need to tell me where's that carbon dioxide going. Yeah. And where it normally goes is into plants, but we're killing the plants, so then where is it going? Right. Like, it seems very logical to me that it's left in the atmosphere. Of course, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is going up. Now you can get into, well, is that actually the cause? And you can, you know, look, there's lots of different arguments people can have about that. And so we can, you know, weave that for another time. But certainly, I think the argument you made earlier holds true, which is, hey, listen, the risk, if it is something bad, is significant. And so, you know, you should probably be aware of it and making plans to mitigate it. Right. And at the same time, I say, well, we probably want to advance ourselves as a better society anyway. Mm -hmm. And so why wouldn't we want to go that direction, right? Like electric cars in a lot of the world are more efficient. They're simply better vehicles. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't we want to have people driving electric cars? You know, hey, listen, why would we want to be burning diesel fuel in a generator behind our house as opposed to having a nice clean source of solar energy that's coming into our house? Like, you know, why wouldn't we want that, right? Like it's just, it's just better. So. Uh, I think the arguments in favor of doing stuff about it yeah. are, and then the timeline is a little bit more questionable. That's, you know. There. Yeah, I, I, I wish there were more infrastructure around, for example, electric cars like you were just talking about. Yeah. I, was, uh, I was talking about, you know, I'm looking to buy a car right now. Yeah. And I was talking to this uh, Greek dealership the other day. They were, they were telling me different options about, you know, uh, what kind of, uh, if, whether I should go diesel or I should yeah. go electric. And if you want to go electric yeah. in, in Greece, um, you know, you can use whatever, maybe 400 miles in a full, full charge, whatever it was like, something like that. And then you, if you want to charge the, the vehicle, it will take you, I think he said like five hours, five to eight hours. Yeah. It's like, man, that's a long time. What if you want to travel across the country? What if you want to travel, you know, in Europe? Yeah. It's like, well... There, there Even if a, you have superchargers and it takes you 45 minutes or right. something, right? Or an hour or whatever. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's, it's, it's still not there to incentivize the public to, uh, you know, to start buying electric all the time. Like, yeah. Uh, so I think if they, if they push on those things a little more, like in, in the US, uh, a lot of my business partners have Tesla, for example. They're telling me how, look, the electricity is like nothing. Yeah. Um, so like you, you basically save on this gas money they yeah. usually pay. Yeah. Um, and they have all these chargers absolutely everywhere. Yeah. So I, th I think that's great. If I were living yeah. in the U.S., I would definitely consider an electric vehicle. Yeah, especially California, Nevada, Texas. Yeah. It's yeah. like anywhere you travel, it's like you, you just charge a thing yeah. and that's it. Yeah. Um, I remember we and, were going... And most people aren't driving around that much that they're gonna need more than a single charge most of the time. Right. Like, okay, if you drive LA to Vegas or something, then yeah, you probably would, but most of your driving is just around the city. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mostly you're fine. Jump into a plane, fly to there, right. rent an Angular Tesla, off you go. So, I think if, if at least here in Europe, there was a lot more of this infrastructure, a lot, lot more chargers, definitely better batteries and all this type of stuff yeah. with the batteries can be for obviously globally. It's not just uh, for here. Um, I do think a lot more people would go electric than they do. Probably some really, you know, enthusiastic electric car people are going to tell us in the comments about uh, how we're wrong. They have cutting edge uh, stuff. Actually, I saw a friend of mine is a huge car enthusiast mm -hmm. and he sent me a video of a very cool car company, electric car company, like high performance, insanely amazing vehicles that are made in Croatia. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So sometime maybe we can go and do a trip there and check it out. It's nice. Yeah. Pretty cool. But, I haven't uh, heard of these guys, but. Yeah. Yeah. I was very impressed. It was like, we're talking like very high end sports car ridiculous nice yeah yeah absolutely the type so what do you think it's going to be in 10 years 10 15 years i think it's just going to continue to improve and, and right? primarily because of tesla right like i think tesla is so far ahead of the game with everybody else and i actually think that from a consumer standpoint where they'll probably win on adoption is not just on electric but on self-driving mm -hmm. and so it's like true once you have this great self-driving car and it happens to be electric 
Like, I'll buy the car because it's self-driving, never mind electric. <laughs> and if the best one is also electric, I'm going to buy electric because I want the best self-driving. Right. right. And in general, I think that's an interesting model that, you know, potentially could push them very, very far. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see what actually happens in terms of that's a very challenging problem to solve. And so who knows what it'll be in terms of them actually getting over, getting over those hurdles. And that's apparently Europe's much worse from a regulatory standpoint in terms of authorizing that kind of stuff. So okay. we'll see. I didn't know that. Wouldn't surprise me. I mean, Europe is kind of bureaucratic in a bunch of these ways. So, so. Well, yeah. what is uh, what is the next thing? What is the next thing? Well, okay. let me see, because I think you would put together a list here. We've covered a bunch of them. And uh, so let me just pull up your list. So we talked about climate change. We talked about wars. We talked about inequal income inequality. Yeah. Uh, we talked about poverty. We talked about government corruption. Okay, we've got discrimination and racism. Yeah, I mean, again, that's not like something that will end the world. Yep. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a terrible thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, and it depends, I guess it depends what country you're in when you talk about racism, because I'm not sure that it's uh, equally uh, everywhere. Yeah. So, so, for example, a uh, lot of black people here in, mm. uh, in, in Bulgaria, they will tell you they have never ever felt anything uh, remotely oh. to... I mean, I know you're going to find a lot of those in the U.S. as well. Where they're like, look, sure. I've never had any problems sure. my entire life. Um, but I, I do think for many reasons, people in the U.S., uh, they have, uh, they, you know, uh, that, that feeling that... Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a feeling. There, there, is, there is racism. I, I don't think that's... Uh, so so let's, let's dig into debatable. this just slightly. Uh, and, you know, I think we can make both sides of the argument, right? Uh, which is, okay, is racism, like when racism exists, it's a problem. Absolutely. Okay, fair enough. Absolutely. Uh, and, of course, racism exists. To what extent it exists, debatable. That's, you know, and it's going to vary based on where it is. Uh, would you say that uh, racism in the reverse sense is and kind of like all the movement around it is justified in a reverse sense meaning the, the backlash against it okay kind of what you know we see this term now anti-racist right the right. anti-racists and uh, uh, i mean in short i don't i i think everybody should be treated equally like it doesn't matter the you know the skin of your color so uh i like, I like the sam harris line you know your skin color should be the least interesting thing about you <laughs> seriously dude it's just <laughs> No, it's 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 a ridiculous thing. Um, so, well, what what can I tell you? So so flip it around. Do you think that the what would we call it? Uh, kind of the modern the modern woke culture. Uh, what are the uh, critical race theory, white fragility type thing? Do you think that movement is a problem? Hmm. Right. I mean, I don't like it. Uh, I think it's bad. Is it a serious problem? Um, so, you know, I... I, I Can I, we classify what a serious problem is? Like, like what, on a, on a national and global level? Like, yeah, like, I mean, it, it, is it something that, you know, is worth devoting a whole bunch of resources to, right? Like, okay. climate change, of climate, like, we're talking about devoting trillions of dollars to climate change. Certainly dealing with pandemics, we're talking about tens of billions of dollars Absolutely. are going to go into, you know, dealing with, let alone the recovery. Now we're into the trillions because we've actually not dealt with it proactively, right? Sure. So, you know, is it a problem in that sense? I think to me what's concerning about it and is concerning generally is I see uh, a backlash against rationality. Okay. And I think that's a problem. I, I, I understand where you're going. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, hey, listen, if you want to have a position and make an art, if you can have a rational position and go to it and work with it, great. No problem. If you are going to advocate irrationality, uh, which is happening in a bunch of cases and very inconsistent beliefs, I think that's a problem. And I think what's even worse is when you teach, when you indoctrinate people into that. Right. I think that's a big problem. So, and 
I have a little bit of a mixed feeling because I look at, I think that there's some major changes that are taking place structurally in society today. And these structural changes uh, are coming about in large part because of the deficiency of our institutions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you look at kind of, I had to go and look up and do some research to understand what postmodernism is all about. But postmodernism is basically about like bring the system down in a lot of regards, right? And that's very much you see, you know, defund the police movements and things like this, right? right? Which is, yeah. Well, I mean, you, yeah, you, and you can get into, you know, what do you mean by that? And is it <laughs> gaslighting? And is it, you know, all this kind of stuff. But, but I, I look at it and I say, okay, well, why is it? That because I have a certain part that I kind of want to say bring down the institutions because they suck, right? Like they're grossly deficient. They have betrayed us in many, many regards. And so I think it's a natural backlash that people would say, fuck these guys, they're shit, we want to take them down. At the same time, I think that the idea of removing those institutions and leaving a vacuum is a very bad idea. Mm -hmm. So I think you kind of have to realize it's hard to fully appreciate as somebody who was born into a functioning system and you know the degree to which it's functioning you can debate but it certainly has got us progressively further as humanity than you know any other period in time mm -hmm. so you're born into this system at how well that system works it's easy to find the faults and there are many many faults but it's equally important to realize that hey listen there is a lot that it gives you and the vacuum of removing that mm -hmm. is really, really bad. Mm -hmm. So what you actually want is you actually want some sort of a way of either reforming that or you want some sort of, and reforming it can seem very tough because the whole point is that they're trying to reform from the inside. And reform from the inside I don't think necessarily works that well. Mm -hmm. So to me, the solution to that, and it kind of comes to what you're seeing in uh, the shift from mainstream media to social media is you basically have competition. Right. Right. Now, that in itself, I think, has raised a new challenge for society, which is, you know, what some people have called uh, a collective crisis of sense making, which is, hey, listen, there's so many voices. It used to be there was very few voices. Those were kind of the voices of authority. It was a broadcast medium, one to many, this sort of thing. There was gatekeepers in terms of your ability to be one of the broadcasters. Today, there's no gatekeepers. And it's a do it's a bi-directional medium, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of voices, and you don't know what to believe anymore. Right. I think that is a problem. I think that we somehow have to, as a humanity, find a way to navigate through this crisis of sense making, mm -hmm. and it's a big challenge for society today. And I think that crisis is giving rise to many many problems. I think that equally to some of these things, you could say all these conspiracy theories. Like the extent to which, you, like conspiracy theories are mainstream today. Mm -hmm. It's not like there was, you know, if you go back, there's always been conspiracy theories, but it's mostly been fringe related. Yeah. yeah. Today, it's like a third of the people on Facebook believe this, yeah. you know, and I don't think that's very healthy. So we have to find some way to get through that. And I think that's a whole conversation that is really worth having uh, at some point in time. So going back to the racism talk. Yep. You believe racism is a problem? Like, yeah, so recap I, a little bit. When, uh, when sure, sure. I mean, look, obviously racism... So, okay, let's start with... There are, there's a, been a redefining of racism, right? So, to me, uh, racism... Is, the, the problem with racism is that it is a logical fallacy. So, you're mm -hmm. operating based on an untruth. And that untruth is that somebody's race uh, has something to do with their ability or performance when it doesn't. Right. Right? So you're basically making a judgment about someone that is invalid. That's a problem. Now, what's the modern version of racism that's kind of been uh, redefined is that, hey, when uh, race meets a power structure, that if you don't have the, if you're not in the predominant power structure, then you can't be racist. Mm -hmm. And the flip side is that if you are in there, you're automatically racist. Right. I think this is bullshit. Mm -hmm. I think it's total crap. And I think that view is equally problematic, in fact, perhaps equally problematic with racism because it's based on a falsehood. Mm -hmm. So I think, generally speaking, we as a society should be building ourselves based on truths, based on accuracy. Mm -hmm. And that's an inaccurate worldview. 
So because it's an inaccurate worldview, it's a problem. That would be my, my position. But to the extent that the former ha is ex in existence, where people are making decisions based on race uh, that should not be made based on race, that's a problem. So I, I kind of, and the good news is, I think the amount of racism as measured this way has generally been decreasing over mm -hmm. time. Obviously, you know, it's a long age old process and you can talk about different ways of getting past it, et cetera. But I think the other thing that's really changing the game is technology. Mm -hmm. Again, I go back to a lot of these because it used to be that it was hard to do a blind interview. You can watch uh, the guy who runs Social Capital. Mm -hmm. He talks about this, about, you know, we've known for a while now that if you listen to violinists and try and decide who the best violinist is, you'll make a worse decision if you're looking at them and if, than if they're behind a screen. Mm -hmm. So why not do the same thing with job applicants? Well, when I'm hiring contractors remotely over the internet, I'm much less likely to look at and be factored into right. their race. When I'm, you know, having a computer make a decision for me, I'm less, it's not going to have that same bias, right? And so I think that's a really positive thing. And I think that a lot of the stereotypes that exist will naturally work themselves out as you rebalance based on those new normals. And what I mean by that is, uh, look, people are going to have biases. They're going to have stereotypes. And well, these, where do those start? They start with actual experience. So if I'm in, I'll give you an example. Yeah. Uh, Tiana, my wife, uh, she's talked to me about feeling bad and noticing stereotypes about Eastern European women. Mm -hmm. Okay, Very unfair stereotypes because they're inaccurate, right? So basically there's ideas of basically gold diggers, uh, people who are, you know, whatever, like that, that whole line of thinking, yeah. right? And so where does that come from? Well, that comes from the fact that people have had some experiences with women who are like that. Right. And then your brain, as a shortcut, tries to develop some simplistic uh, model of the world in order to shortcut to the decision-making process. Right. But then your brain starts to make wrong decisions based on that. Now, it's a, it has a payoff because in better than 50-50% of the time, maybe it's right or whatever. I don't know whether it's probably, probably not that case, but uh, whatever those numbers are. So similarly, what happens? Well, you see that, hey, listen, Islamic terrorists tend to be from Islamic countries, you know? So people start racially profiling, mm -hmm. you know? It's like, well, they don't see any Asians who are doing that. Now, mm -hmm. does it mean that Asians can't, is race, does race have anything to do with that? No, race has nothing to do with that right. at all. But they're creating stereotypes based on a real data set, right? right? The data set is accurate or is real. It's just that it then gets misconstrued and applied to something uh, fallacious. Mm -hmm. And so I, this is why I say, if you have, it's kind of like when people, you know, I travel lots, right? When you travel a lot and you engage with a lot of different groups of people, it tends to break down those stereotypes because you start to meet people and be like, well, actually the people I know aren't like that. Yeah. So I think that over time, as you start to be exposed to a more diverse group of people, as we get more globalized, as we get into a situation where uh, we start to rebalance them, because there were some structural problems historically, right? And so as those structural problems start to slowly get corrected for, you will over time uh, break down some of those stereotypes. And that's a long road. I think that it's, you know, Do you think this has anything to do with education? And if education, for example, changed or not necessarily changed, uh, but... Yeah, if education was, was a bit different in yep. the early years of, of a child, as well as family, yes. and the way the family passes on yes. certain ideals on, on a child. Yes, I do. If that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think probably not in the way that some of the organizations would like to push it. Again, this book that I read, they talked that whole section on racism. Mm -hmm. uh, very cool. And basically, they were talking about, so I think that teaching people about racism doesn't do a great job of eliminating racism. I actually think it might cause racism. And I've seen some examples of this uh, during some of my time living in the States. But what they gave the example of was doing group projects where you were working with people from different races. Right. So you're not saying anything about racism. You're just saying, hey, look, you're in a group where you're working with these people. You work together towards a common goal. Right. Those people are much less likely to have racist tendencies and so on and so forth. So 
those are formative periods that I think can be super helpful. And uh, there's a lot we can do proactively in that sense to teach kind of implicitly uh, because racism is, is almost inherently implicit. Mm -hmm. So that would be my, my perspective on it. What about you? Oh man, um, I think I think we might get too nuanced again about this. Sure. And I don't, I have no idea. Do you have any clue how long we've been going at this far? I mean, we've been going for uh, I mean for sure over an hour. Yeah, for sure. Over an okay, because because well, I, I think uh, we have quite quite a few more to to cover. We, we have, let's, let's just I'll try and spitball through them, yeah. and then we can uh, finish it off. And you guys can tell us which ones you you know are These most. These are interested. very very deep subjects. I think if both of us get in them, we, in, well, I mean the idea right is to cover them at least you know right uh, over a whole episode. You know where we can go really deep. And exactly. Can, yeah. Exactly. 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 Yeah. So that's the idea. You guys can send us your uh, your thoughts. Okay, yeah. some of the other ones that you had here were clean water and water pollution, uh, as well as the broader topic of ocean conservation. Mm -hmm. I think I think these are like subtopics of like climate change as well, Could which be. we yep. sort of uh, talked about. Yep, yep, makes sense. Uh, lack of education. We kind of touched a little bit on that. Yeah, um, and it's also. You know, this is not just a lack of education, uh, like in, in modern countries. It's it's also like in Africa, for example, like what kind of education do those children have? And, you know, what kind of impact does that have later on in their life? So, I, I'm, so. I'm going to throw out a reverse one on this. Uh, I think that in general, I'd love us to do an episode at least on each of the major systems in a country, like the healthcare system, the education system, the criminal justice system, the governance system, whatever, the financial system, the tax system, uh, because I think we can discuss problems within those systems and how to address them. Yeah. Uh, not that we necessarily have the solutions, but we can brainstorm some cool ideas and yeah, we yeah. Can bring, in, bring in some experts. Uh, but there is an interesting thing that apparently there's some data that suggests that actually education doesn't cause countries to be wealthy. Wealth in countries causes them to be educated. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they researched, did some cross analysis. It's in uh, Nassim Taleb's book, uh, Anti-Fragile. He talks about it. There's some, some famous lady who did some research on it. And she looked at, for instance, Egypt, which highly educated their people and it didn't help them out. Uh, so I think that there's something to be said, like there's a very, education's a really fine one because there's like practical education and then there's a bunch of education that's just superfluous. Right. And it costs more, which is the problem, but it's not necessarily beneficial for a society. Yeah. So, but we, me and you were talking about it without, again, trying, without going too deep into to it. Weeds, but, yep. um, how could education be reformed to be a lot more beneficial sure. for uh, humankind in general? Yeah. Like, uh, like in the U.S., for example. Like, how could they reform it there so it can be much better? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's a, I mean, I think a, a good topic because yeah. I see it as like you're investing in the young people of the world. And those yep. are the people who are gonna run the country in 20, 40 years. So, you know, you want those people to be the best possible, right? So, makes sense. Um, lack of economic opportunity was the next one that we kind of talked about that yes. a little bit, right? Yes. Uh, let's see here. Uh, access to food in certain countries uh, and contrasting that with obesity being a uh, massive problem. Right. Yep. Yeah. So, kind of talk about it when uh when we talked about poverty and all this type of stuff mm -hmm. uh but yeah uh, and and you spoke of obesity and how people now are obese and uh you know not uh, taking care of themselves or not yeah i think it's a broader broader conversation of just unhealthy living in general yes. and uh which is one of the things that you were talking about when it comes to pandemics is it yep. going to positively reinforce people to be more healthy yeah to have stronger immune systems so they can fight off viruses and stuff like that so yep. yeah yeah I, I think it's a conversation that we sort of had but do you think there's something to add there I, I think there's a like i think there's a microcosm of that that for sure is worth an episode Absolutely. of just you know sitting and going down into like modern unhealthy living mm -hmm. and I think you can probably break that into hey listen you know environmental causes right you're in an environment that's bad for you to how you're eating to the modern work environment like the fact that we tend to sit which tends not to be good for Stuff us. Stuff we're guilty of. Uh, for oh us. absolutely yeah, yeah. absolutely 100 <laughs> percent yeah it's uh it's quite horrible so yeah so there's just one more and then I think that's uh that's it and then we can kind of we're gonna conclude it huh yeah conclude it for uh cool. for this one uh but it is uh, overpopulation. Right. 
Right. So, what do you, what do you think about that? So, I, I've heard that it's going to peak at about ten billion, and it's going to uh, drastically uh, go down from there. But uh, I, I haven't I, done much research on it myself, which is why I'm asking you. Yeah. So, I, I'm pretty aware. Uh, there's a book called Factfulness, great book, and they talk about the research, the data on it. Yeah, we're expected to peak around the year 2100. I don't remember the exact number. Somewhere between ten and twelve billion, or something, uh, people. I am, so I think you can make an argument that there is a case for uh, decreasing population being a problem, mm -hmm. which is the opposite, right? That's the, the funny thing. And I, so I think we can have a whole conversation about that, which is, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that the bigger problem with overpopulation is simply overconsumption. Yeah. And so consumption is linked in some regard to population. And so, you know, I, it's a really interesting one because we have an aging population and we could have a serious crisis in the growth patterns of our economic systems that we're just not prepared for at all. Uh, there's yeah, counter yeah. arguments to it as well. And so we yeah. can look at that. And then I think we can look at, yeah, what are the consequences of not just having more people, you know, you can make, you can show how you, okay, great. You can feed another 2 billion people. That's not going to be a problem. Yeah. Uh, but more, hey, listen, if you have another 6 billion people who are consuming, you know, let's say an average of four to eight times more than they're consuming right now, mm. what kind of strain does that put on the systems of the world? Right. And how do we deal with that? That's a, that's a big issue. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, it, it's an interesting one to get into. Uh, because we can break down kind of the sub pieces of hopefully while avoiding all the conspiracies. I mean, and, and there's quite a few more, I think. But yeah, you know, we would be diving into quite a lot of conspiracies. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm afraid. Yeah, I mean, you know, who says they're conspiracies? It's uh... no, I, no. I'm just saying there's there's many there there are many things that people think about without any actual factual um, evidence to suggest anything. Uh, for, th th for... They will tell you that they're very factual. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So lots of evidence. For... You're just blind to it. <laughs> I don't know, man. All right. Um, I think there's one more that I Great. didn't mention it there, Perfect. but again, I'm trying not to get into this whole yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah. That is uh, probably alien civilizations that are already here. Sure. I know there was a recent. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what was a, super a recent. Um, um, who was it from? Was it from NASA? Who was it yeah, from? Yeah, NASA this released thing something. From yeah. UFO findings of uh, some time back. Yeah, and it's like, well, that's that's quite interesting. Super um, interesting. So, me and you were having a conversation in the car the other day about, well, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Will yeah. they just want to fucking wipe us out or, or what, right? So, yeah. I mean, that's, uh, look, if it turns out that we are exposed to aliens on top of everything else in over the next, you know, 100 years, it's going to be an interesting century, that's for sure. Yeah. So I do think this is the most interesting time to be alive. Absolutely, yeah. Quite yeah. frightening from one side, but from the other side, it's like, oh man. Super exciting in other regards. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. Cool. So, all right. Well, guys, uh, this obviously was us, you know, spitballing around some ideas, and the the concept here is that what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, each of these subjects, and we'll probably break them down into smaller pieces. Yeah. And one per episode, we're going to go through. And sometimes we'll bring in experts, etc. cetera. Uh, we'd love to hear from you guys if you have some ideas about what it's going to be, you know, what, what things should be discussed, your perspectives on problems. But to really focus on the solution side. So to go through and say, okay, great, here's the nuances of that problem. And therefore, how can we address it? And not necessarily to say we're going to come up with the answer, but really to get some brainstorming going exactly. so that hopefully it spurs other ideas so that, you know, collectively we can start to do something about it. So I hope you enjoyed it. Please click the subscribe button. Please, uh, please click the like button. Share it with your friends. Be willing to sit here for another two fucking hours every <laughs> week or whatever, whatever, however often we put these things out. And uh, if nothing else, you know, you can be entertained by two narcissistic assholes thinking that they're... <laughs> smart enough to talk about this stuff so anyway thanks very much thanks Subscribe. for watching absolutely bye bye <laughs>